Welcome back to Bully Ball, a San Francisco 49er podcast. We're here to recap this 49ers versus Broncos preseason game, give you guys some winners and some losers, and, you know, just talk about who we think is going to make this team. We have one more preseason game against the Chargers this next week, and then a week off and the season starts against the Pittsburgh Steelers on the road. So let's just hop right into it. San Francisco 49ers beat the Broncos at home 21 to 20. It was a comeback win. What were your guys' first initial thoughts just watching the game live, just right after the game reaction? Um, you know, it was a good game. Super late out here for us in Europe. I'm sure Joseph was aware as well. I ended up falling asleep in the uh, fourth quarter. But it was a good game. Very surprised with all three quarterbacks. They all played pretty well. Uh, Brock Purdy, you know, first action back since the NFC Championship game. And, you know, he looked just as good as he did before he left. You know, he didn't have any down-the-field passes or anything too crazy. It was a lot of dink and dunk stuff. You know, Debo, a couple screens, Ayuk on a slant. The impressive throw was the one to Juwan Jennings. You know, I think uh, Ayuk in the flat was his first read. And then he ended up a couple of Juwan Jennings. Very impressive. Looked very efficient. Uh, so that was good to see. And then, you know, going into Trey and Sam. Sam looked very good as well. Very effective. And then Trey definitely improved a lot from that last game that we saw from him. Definitely. Any first thoughts on the game after the game, Dad? You know, I was – uh, it was pretty good. You know, I was pretty impressed. You know, like he was saying, Purdy came out, really didn't miss a beat at all from where he was last year. Looked like he, he has, like, a good little ownership of the team right there. You know, it looks like the guys believe in him. He came out and looked like a true number one. And, you know, I was one of the ones that was still – you know, maybe Trey could take it this year. You know, Sam Darnold was in there. They all looked good. Trey looked good, but Purdy did come in, and he just came in and looked like he was the number one. Everything was moving, you know, so it's it's good. All I care about is somebody comes in and could give us the wins. Yeah, definitely, and it was a little nerve-wracking seeing Brock Purdy take that first sack. Looked like he kind of got hit in the arm. And then he rolls out to the left near the goal line. And then instead of going out of bounds, cuts back in, kind of like that Jimmy G play back in the day, if you remember, takes a hit. So I was like, oh, shoot, this dude. He, uh, <laughs> I mean, the good thing is, is he's not playing with any restriction. You know, he's not playing scared. So that's good. But I would have liked him to you know, slide, go out of bounds, do something like that. But anyways, let's jump into some of the stats before we dive into the performances. So the 49ers were playing Russell Wilson and Jarrett Stidham, who both have given them problems in the past. And both players played well. Russ was three for six, 24 yards, but he did a lot of damage on the ground running. He had... Three rushes for 25 yards. I believe he picked up two first downs on those runs. And then Jared Stidham was 12 of 17 for 130 yards, and he had a 92 passer rating, so pretty good. Um, 49ers, all three quarterbacks, over 90 passer rating. Trey Lance, 93. Sam Darnold, 93.2. Brock Purdy, 118.8. Um, one interception for Trey Lance and Sam Darnold. Can't really put the Sam Darnold interception on him. That was on Ronnie Bell, who we will speak on later. But 11 for 14, 109 yards, one touchdown, one interception for Sam. But realistically should have been 12 of 14, you know, almost a perfect day for him. Trey Lance, 12 of 18, 173 one touchdown, one interception, terrible interception by him. Started off really slow, but then he picked it up at the end. Last two drives, led scoring drives, and led the comeback win. 
If you haven't watched uh, the QB school, JT O'Sullivan's breakdown of Trey Lance's performance, he kind of talks about, you know, he starts slow. It looks like he even says a an NFL quarterback doesn't miss these throws at first, but then he picks it up and he's like, these are elite NFL quarterback throws. So it's kind of like an all over the board performance. So let's start with the offense. We'll go quarterbacks last. But who are some winners for you guys on the offense this week? Uh, first winner, Ronnie Bell. You know, that guy has just been playing. You know, obviously he had the interception that we talked about for Sam Darnold. You know, hit him right on the face mask. On the face mask. Got through his hands, hit him on the face mask, which led to the interception. And then last week, he also had another one where it hit off his hands, I think, for an interception, too. But, uh, you know, he's just like his yak ability is up there, you know, looking like a little mini Debo or something like that. Uh, he had a nasty stiff arm, took the dude to the ground and everything. And then just when he gets the ball in his hands, he looks explosive. Uh, definitely looked a lot better with the punt and kickoff returns this week which is obviously going to be a big factor to him making the 53 because if he can have that alone, that's enough to make that roster. Then if he can bring some to the wide receiver room as well, that's huge. Um, but, yeah, it looks good with the ball in his hands. You know what I mean? He fits our offense, which you love to see. And, you know, I'm excited to watch him going forward. So that's definitely a winner in my book. Yeah, he also had a fumble this week, though. So, He's having some ball security issues, kind of reminiscent of Richie James. You know, the dude had the yips, and that got him cut because he was dropping catchable passes. But like you said, Ronnie Bell played great. Seven receptions for 114 yards, 16.3 yard average, and he had nine targets on the day, the most by double. The second most was four by a player on the 49ers. So. Up and down day, but overall better than worse. Looks to be leading that fifth wide receiver, maybe fourth right now with some of the stuff going on um, on the team. What about you, Dad? Any offensive winners on the week? You know, I'm going to jump in on that one as well. He looks like a little baller. Like he's one of the guys we need to get the ball control. You know, that needs to get handled because – one pick each week and those should have been catches all day you know he did have that fumble i think it's because he he's one of those guys that they say plays like uh like debo you know they run so hard and they go so hard that you get some of those balls coming up once he tightens that up he's gonna be legit you know and then the other one was that uh i don't i don't know his name uh the tight end Cam Latu. Latu, yeah, because I remember at first we were like, what the hell are we doing getting this guy? And he did pretty good. You know, he had that touchdown in there. He had he had a couple catches. He He's doing uh, – he's coming around. Yeah, he was uh, three for 46, 15-yard average, one touchdown, and he had four targets, second most on the team. And, yeah, I agree. He was getting open, creating some separation. Most importantly, he was catching the ball. You know, he wasn't squandering his opportunities like he's been all camp. So you love to see that for him. My guy, I'm going with a starter, Debo Samuel. Dude been busting his butt all offseason, training hard this time around. Been working out with Saquon Barkley, and you could see it. The dude looked explosive. He looked fast. He didn't look like that last year, you know. It looks like it's going to be a big year for Debo. He only caught two passes for 39 yards, but you saw what he did with the ball in his hand. And with Brandon Ayuk becoming a true wide receiver one, it's going to open up more of those explosive opportunities for Debo like he had in his breakout year. So I really expect a big year from him. Hey, Any other hey. players from you guys? Jennings can't pass yeah. up on Jennings, man. He he had some catches, you know, he's getting physical already. So it's going to be exciting to see him this year too. Yeah. Jennings is that 
glue guy, you know, the third down machine, third and one or whatever they say. Mm -hmm. But third and Juwan. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and like you said, Ronnie Bell, you know, he, he's definitely going to have a path to make that 53, man, with all these uh, receiver injuries. Obviously, Ray Ray McLeod broke his wrist, and it's going to be out, I think, at least until week one, if not more. And then Danny Gray also has a little shoulder injury going on. I'm not too sure how long he's going to be out, but that's two injuries, you know, that can open up that, that door for Ronnie Bell to make the roster. So definitely something to keep an eye on. Uh, yeah, a couple winners in my book. Obviously, Brock Purdy, like we said, first action back. And he looked efficient, didn't look to be like he was in pain or couldn't throw the ball. You know, like we said, he wasn't stretching the field. He did escape from some pressure a couple times. Uh, you know, that one sack he almost got away from. But, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about a player who contributed to that in the loser section. Uh, but, yeah, Brock Purdy looked great. Led the offense down with efficiency, so that's a winner in my book. And then uh, another one, Colton McKivitz, starting right tackle. You know, he was out there for that first drive. I think uh, blocking and gave up zero pressures. So that's very convincing because, you know, that's almost one of the biggest weaknesses on our offense right now. And it was good to see him hold up. You know, the Broncos have good pass rushers too. Uh, Frank Clark. Randy Gregory, just to name a couple of them. I know they have that rookie. Uh, he was given one of our other tackles trouble. I can't think of his name, but he was really good. Um, they also have Zach Allen from the Cardinals. Yes. Yeah, that guy. DJ and then DJ Jones, who, too. who was the other guy? DJ Jones. Oh, Nick Benito. Yeah, Nick Benito. Yeah. So Colton McKibbitts, you know, held up well which is very convincing, and hopefully we can just see it going forward. Hopefully he can uh, have some concerns because we need it. But Colton McKivitz and Brock Purdy are some of my uh, big winners of this preseason game. Yeah, and unfortunately we cannot show you guys any all-22 footage because the NFL is being very greedy and trying to make as much money as possible. So they sold the NFL International Pass to Dazzin, and now we don't get all 22 film anymore. So that's just great, and we're paying more money. But anyways, another player that we would want to mention um, on the offensive line, Il Manning. You know, the past two weeks, he's played great. He did struggle a bit. We saw Nick Benito was a speed rusher, and he got him. He beat him a couple of reps. But – he was going against Randy Gregory and Frank Clark a lot of the game because those players played the whole game for some reason. Don't know why. Um, and Il Manning just has great technique at tackle for a guy that's 6'2 with short arms. He just has great technique. He's overcome the deficiencies, and he somehow wins against most pass rushers. Speed rush is an issue that he has to work on, but – at, in my opinion, he's probably your best backup tackle at the moment. So what do you guys think about him? Have you seen anything on him? Yeah, I agree. Like like me and you were talking, he probably should be competing for that swing tackle position. Obviously, he needs to work on the speed rush, though, because Nick Benito got him like three or four reps in a row just on a speed rush, which is – concerning and something that he needs to fix but uh yeah it looked good you know very surprising i think he was undrafted too out of hawaii right yeah so you don't you know hawaii doesn't play anybody anybody notable at least so it's very surprising for an undrafted guy out of there uh yeah you know look forward to seeing what he can bring i don't think if you i don't think you'll be able to sneak him onto the practice squad so he's gonna have to find a way to fight for that spot you know, Jalen Moore is out there. I'm never too interested in Jalen Moore, especially with the way that he wears his hair and his helmet. Just looks so unathletic and unintimidating. Like, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, Ill man, definitely somebody to keep an eye on for this next week, too. Yeah, and just yeah. one thing to note about that real fast is the 49ers probably have the two smallest offensive linemen 
per their position in the NFL. Il Manning, like we said, 6'2", 32-inch arms, that's nobody in the NFL is that small at tackle. And then you have Jason Poe at guard who's six foot, 300 pounds. Nobody in the NFL is that small at guard. So they are backups, but it is interesting to see. The 49ers love the speed guys, you know, agility, but they are – way out of the norm they're deviants at the position as you would say you know it's crazy to see yeah definitely uh let's move on to some losers on the offensive side of the ball who uh joseph who's your first loser on the offensive side first loser is obviously danny gray dude on the first play of the game he's kickoff returning gets hurt that's been an issue for him. He's had a, a lot of little nagging injuries that have kept him off the field. And this is the year that he's supposed to step in as that borderline wide receiver three, four, take some reps from Juwan, but also be that fourth receiver pretty much automatically. He's supposed to beat out Ray Ray McLeod for that fourth receiver spot. It's not going to happen, you know, right now. Looks like he's working his way off the team more than on the team. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback on that. We haven't seen what he could do the whole time he's been with us. You know, it's always something with him. Shit, I don't even remember the last time we've seen anything good out of him besides, you know, the, them talking about him a little bit when we first got him. Yeah, you know, he did have some he did have some convincing plays in the preseason last year, hooking up for Trey Lance a couple times, but ever since then, nothing much. I would say a big loser to me, kind of group this one up, is the running back room behind Christian McCaffrey. You know, Ty Davis Price has done nothing to separate himself from Jordan Mason. Elijah Mitchell, anybody. The dude, he when he's running, he's not doing much. And then his pass blocking is dog shit terrible. Dog shit terrible. Like you can't have a running back that's gonna pass block like that. I would I wouldn't even let him I wouldn't even let him make the team if I was a coach, to be honest, because that shit's just unacceptable. Jordan Mason too. Hasn't really done anything. Looked a little better this week, but still does, didn't look like great. Not breaking off chunk runs. And then Elijah Mitchell has just squandered the opportunity because of injuries per usual. Same thing last year. You know, it's just too injury prone. So nobody's separated themselves really to take over that RB2 spot. You know, it seems like Christian McCaffrey's going to have to take most of the load. Which you know is fine because Christian McCaffrey's a great running back, but he also has his health concerns. So you want to relieve some of that from him with a guy like Ty Davis Price. You know, take some of those second, third down runs. You know, that are short yardage, but he hasn't shown anything to do that. I think the best running back this preseason so far has been uh, McNichols, and we signed him like a day or two before the first preseason game. But he's looked the most explosive to me. So I would say the running back room behind McCaffrey definitely probably the biggest loser, second biggest loser uh, this preseason, this training camp. I agree with that. And I will say you said Jeremy McNichols has looked the best, and that is true. He got hurt this week. He strained his hamstring, so he's out. So the 49ers go out and sign Brian Hill, who's been with the team, hasn't done anything in the past. So, so it's looking rough. And we had said last season in the playoffs, Christian McCaffrey was getting worn down because he's taken like 30 touches a game pretty much. It was bad. And I agree. Jordan Mason would like to see more from him because he was very promising last year. But I think that goes on to another loser is the rest of the offensive line. Do blowing out our ears over here. <laughs> the rest of 
the offensive line besides Ill Manning. You know, Jason Poe has looked okay, but he's made a lot of mistakes. Uh, the backup, pretty much every backup doesn't look rosterable at the moment. And they've opened no holes. They've given up a ton of pressure in sacks. It's been bad. You know, what can you do to fix that before the season? Because you have O-line injuries throughout the season. What do, what do you, what can you do to fix that? Poach the uh, Raiders offensive lineman that they that get cut. That's what you do to fix that. Um, yeah, John Feliciano, you know, the guy that we signed, I think he was with the Bills last, was supposed to be able to hold down the interior three on the offensive line. And he looked terrible too. That fool was giving up sacks. I think he gave up at least one sack and a few pressures. So that's not good. Like you said, Jason Paul hasn't looked too great. Nick Sakal hasn't looked great. The fucking four-year mastermind at Fordham, which doesn't make any sense to me still. But, yeah, the depth is definitely concerning with the offensive line and running back positions this year for sure. There was one play where it looked like Sam Darnold was going to get injured because he got blasted. Mm -hmm. by by someone running free up the middle. How would you feel about the O-line play, Dad? Yeah, after our ones, there's not much. You know, the guys, nobody's stepping in, stepping up to take take control of a number two. But we knew that in the draft. We needed to address that, and we didn't. You know, I don't know why. I don't know what they seen. Yeah, your number ones are good, but, like, they're not going to go all game, you know, and be just as tough in the fourth as they were in the first. And we just overlooked it. And I don't know. I, I guess they thought we had some good number twos and nobody's stepping up right now. And we're running out of time a couple weeks away. Yeah. And Disappointing. One, last, one last thing on the offensive side before we move to defense. It is unbelievable to me that you have Frank Gore – I know he's in the front office. He's working in the front office, not a coach. But you have Frank Gore in this building, and you have the worst pass-blocking running back in the NFL on your team. Because if you remember Frank Gore, <laughs> that dude, I would argue, was the best pass-blocking running back of his time in his era. That dude would stonewall 250-pound linebackers that you used to have back in those days. And then you got Ty Davis Price out here, who was supposed to be a power back. I don't get it. He's supposed to be a power back running people over, scared to touch people running free to the quarterback. I don't get it. Don't make sense to me. But but, but let's see how it goes next year. Because these guys were there before Gore came. So let's see when Gore has his input in it to be able to make calls and his opinion on players for the future. Let's see what, how that turns out. Very yeah. true. Speak for that play that Jacob's talking, there was literally two free rushers coming up the same hole that Ty Davis Price was supposed to block. And this dude tries to hit ankles and whips on both of them. <laughs> both. It's ghosts. Like, I, it's bad. Ty Davis Price, man. We didn't like the pick then. Still don't like the pick now. Yeah. But – Let's uh, look to the defensive side of the ball. Who are some winners that you guys have on the defensive side of the ball from this game? Dad, you want to go first? Go ahead. Let me think about this real quick. All right. My first, I'll start with the starters since they did play, obviously, is uh, Javon Hargrave. You know, that dude played, I think he played three or four plays. And he flashed on every single play. You know, first play of the game, instantly beats the guard and has a sack, but he gets horse collared basically, pulls him away, and then Russell's able to escape and get like a first down. But love to see that immediately because, as I said last year, the interior pass rush was non existent. Nobody could get pressure from the interior. And then the next play, um, pocket breaks down, Russ escapes, and Hargrave tracks him down for like a one-yard gain. Just love to see it. It's going to be an immediate upgrade and impact on this defense. 
Yeah, yeah. I agree with that because he he was there. He you see the ball where the ball was. He was somewhere right there. So that was good. And the the linebacker. That oh Jalen Graham. Yeah, he he did good. He looks real promising. He's gonna be a little baller too. Yeah, He's impressed with him. Late round uh, 49ers linebackers picks, you know, it's always going to come through. I think a lot of people are expecting a lot out of D winners, but Jalen Graham has been out playing in my opinion. You know, D winners did have that nice uh, sideline tackle. I think it was on the quarterback that ended up being a fumble turnover on downs. Uh, the closing speed from D winners on that play was pretty, pretty insane. But I think another winner in my book, somebody who's, Surprised me a little bit is uh, Clee Farrell. You know, I think he's stepped up a decent amount in Drake Jackson's absence. And, you know, he's looking pretty good. Get some decent pressures. His motor's there. So I could definitely see him possibly starting over Drake Jackson, depending, you know, like we, we haven't seen much of Drake Jackson in the free at all. So, you know, depending on what we see from him, Cleveland Farrell looks at least like a good third D end. Hopefully, doesn't have to be our second D end because we need to get Bosa back in the fucking building ASAP. We're coming down to the season and still not signed and not any news of progress. So that needs to happen ASAP. But that's yeah. another winner for me, Cleve Farrell. Yeah, I'll touch on and I'll say – you know, the DBs, you know, a majority of them. You have Ambry Thomas, who he did get burnt. He got cooked on one play. I think it was one that almost was a touchdown. But other than that, dude's played great this preseason, and he's opened the door to get some starting reps because they're willing to move Demo Lenore inside, who was your starting cornerback outside. So, you know, that's promising to see. And then also you had Sam Womack have two pass breakups. Looks He's looked good in coverage. He did get burned once last week, but he's looked very good in coverage. He just doesn't get his head around to the ball. And he did that twice in this game. So that is promising improvement. And I would say, obviously, the linebacker group is the best in the league. But the 49er strength this year, other than them, looks to be the DBs and not the D-line, which is very uh, interesting considering this team. Very yeah, cool. Definitely. And, like, uh, start this game, you know, it was, I think it was surprising to a lot of people, was Ambry Thomas started outside with Mooney Ward, and then Demo Lenore came in starting slot. So the position's open, you know, whether it's, Demo starting outside and then going in when it comes to nickel time. Demo slides inside, Amber on the outside, or Womack on the outside. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, Sam Womack, too, was our starting slot to start the year last year. So that's something to keep your eye on as well. So there's a lot of options out there. You know, Tashawn Gibson looked great. Or was he playing? Did he play this last week? I don't think he played. No, no. Brown started with Hufanga. Well, Jair Brown, you know, had that uh, touchdown saving tackle right at the end of the half that Amber Thomas got burnt on. That was the play that Joseph was talking about. Jair Brown was the one that tracked him down and saved that touchdown right at like the one or two yard line. So Jair Brown looked good. Jair Brown has looked pretty good too throughout this whole uh, – preseason so far you know he had that great tackle coming up and run support last week and then he had the touchdown saving one this week so that's good um you know do you have any any other winners before i talk about a big loser yeah i want to say so i mentioned hargrave and i mentioned the weakness last year was the interior d line against the run i think that's still going to be an issue this year but against the pass, looked great in this game as well. T.Y. McGill had a sack, and he had um, a QB hit that led to what should have been an interception. But I believe it was McCrary Ball who dropped the interception. So, you know, 
T.Y. McGill flashed last year. He's always flashed in the preseason. Very good interior pass rusher. And then Marlon Davidson did not look good against the run, like I said. But against the pass, you know, he was creating some pressure on the interior. So big ups on the interior pressure this year. But the still against the run, it's rough. Right yeah. up the middle. Too. They were even saying that, like, that's where people are going to get their yards, man. We got to get that shit figured out. Definitely. Um, yeah, Marlon Davidson, too, second-round pick. Uh, a couple years ago, I think 2020 was a second-round pick. And he has inside-out versatility as well. So Marlon Davidson definitely looked good. High motor, for sure, as well. Um, moving on to the losers. I think the biggest loser so far, probably of all, the whole team, offense, or er, no, I would say the second biggest loser then, actually. Isaiah Oliver, you know, that guy, I thought he was going to be a great addition in the slot, you know, looked very good for Atlanta. And then this, he just looked bad. He's gotten burnt, missing tackles. He had an open field tackle that he just whiffed on completely this game against the Broncos. Uh, doesn't look great in pass coverage. So Isaiah Oliver has to be probably the second biggest loser on the team, in my opinion. Yeah. Is that after after Moody? Wait, we're yeah. not there yet. We're <laughs> not there yet. But, um, you know, it's very interesting because I just said, you know, the DB group looks the deepest, second to the linebackers. But the two people that are <laughs> Steve Wilkes brought in because he's a DB coach are Isaiah Oliver and Miles Hartsfield, and they've looked terrible. So I don't know. It's very interesting, very weird dynamic. But I agree, you know, I, I, the 49ers gave him a good amount of guaranteed money. So he probably makes a team, but should he? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, you know, and a guy that probably gets cut for him is probably safety Taylor Hawkins, who he's looked good. I wouldn't say he's a winner, but he's looked good. Um, another loser, I would say. Probably the DNs, you know, every DN besides you said uh, Farrell, nobody has stepped up and filled that need. You know, it's oh, it's wide open. You could be a starter if you play well, but you have Austin Bryant, who they brought in, looked like he was a reclamation project that they wanted. You know, he's done nothing. You have Spencer Wagey, undrafted guy from NDSU, done nothing. They had Alex Barrett playing defensive end in the first quarter, you know, once Farrell and them went off the field. This dude has been a practice squad guy his whole life. You know, he's an undersized interior pass rusher. And they have him playing significant reps in the preseason on the edge. There's no depth on this team at edge rusher. It's bad. If Nick Bosa ain't in the building week one, you're going to get cooked. I'm sorry to say it's going to be a, a long week, but there's no depth at edge rusher on this team, and it's bad. Yeah, I agree. Definitely not like the last few years with, uh, you know, what was the guy that uh, we got from the Rams again? I forget his name. Epicom. And then um, our other guy that went to the Chiefs. Oh, Manahue. Oh, Manahue. Obviously, he's suspended for the first few games this year. But, no, those guys were great depth pieces. You Jordan know. Willis, who we saw get a sack yeah. in week one against us. Yeah. No depth. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I don't. I can't think of any other losers. One of the, I mean, I guess you could consider him a loser a little bit. Deshaun Jameson. You know, the undrafted safety corner out of Texas. Uh, just, I would say, loser because of that muffed punt that he had. You know, that was his pathway to make the roster was on special teams. And then he muffed a punt. So that's kind of putting him in the loser bracket for me, kind of muddying up that situation for him a little bit. Um, you have any other losers, Dad, on defense? 
No, I think uh, I think you hit them all. You need some help. And then, yeah, going to the biggest loser of the whole team, obviously, Jake Moody. Jesus Christ, man. That dude, what? I'll say there's one worse, one worse than him. The special team coach got to be fired immediately. Oh, yeah. He's the worst because it, it was Jake Moody, but it was also Mitch Wisnowski, and it was also Deshaun Jameson. It was every every unit of special teams. So and we thought that yeah, one dude true. was bad, that little short dude that we had, uh, the yeah, special little, teams coach. Yeah. Because, uh, Mo- I mean, Wisnowski had three punts, 35 yard average. I didn't know this as well. I think last year he had like a 40 or 45 yard average, which was second worst in the NFL. So he was terrible even last year. And then this year, like you said, a special teams coach, like, yeah, I put him through the most rigorous workout ever. The long snappers were terrible and he was nailing these kicks. And then this year, like this preseason missed two last week made. Let's see. Let me see what he made this week. I know. He missed a PAT, and then, which is very concerning because if you can't make the PATs, there's something going on. Um, he made a 43 yarder, and then he obviously made the game winning kick. Barely, barely made the game winning kick. That thing, if he was like five yards back, that thing was going wide right for sure. So, Jake Moody's very, that's very concerned because we're going to need those kicks. You know, Kyle Shannon doesn't really like to go for it too much when we're down there in the red zone. Um, yeah, especially going from Robbie Gold, good as gold, you know, very efficient. Couldn't make the longest field goals, but anything like 40 yards in, he was nailing for sure, 45 yards in nailing. Um, yeah, that dude looks rough. I'd rather – take the L on the draft pick and just cut him or whatever and let Zane Gonzalez kick rather than lose games this year because of him, because we have too much pride to be like, oh, we fucked up, you know, let's keep him anyways because we don't want to look stupid. I'd rather just let him go, take the L, and just win games with Zane Gonzalez if that's what it has to be. Yeah, it's crazy. It seems like he gets the yips in game because in practice they say he's solid. I wonder if when they were going through this rigorous workout, if they were just having him kick 60-yard kicks because supposedly that's what he's good at. But once it gets shorter than that, he's missing. Where's the accuracy? I don't know, but that dude, it's the preseason too. This ain't live action. Wait until the lights are even brighter in the real games, let alone the playoffs. We might have a Brett Maher in the playoffs. And I'll be pissed off if we lose a playoff game because this dude misses kicks. And you figure right now, too, the weather's good. It's hot. You know, the ball's not hard to kick. You remember Green Bay when Robbie Gold had to hit the game winner over there? Freezing cold, like negative degrees, snow. He's not going to be able to do that. You know what I mean? There's no way. Like, it's concerning. Especially once you start, like, Pittsburgh playing in Pittsburgh week one this year. You know that's going to be interesting because that field, you know, the wind and everything out there. Uh, the windy city. Oh, wait, no, that's Chicago. My that's, yeah. So, like, it's going to be uh, it's gonna be interesting, man. Like I said, I'd rather just take the L on them, just fucking cut ties already, rather than lose games this year because we have a bad kicker. Personal. And then you have that terrible kickoff, too. Like the 30 yard kickoff that ended up almost working for us because the their guy muffed it. I don't know. I don't I don't even know what. Well, and when he misses, he's not barely missing. He's damn near hitting the sideline. I mean, those balls are way wide. They're not even hitting the net. Like the yeah. net that's behind the field goal post. He's almost hitting fans and shit out there. Like cheerleaders are gonna be getting certain. knocked out on the sidelines. Yeah, yeah. He's, they didn't reel it in with them. I don't even know. No, clue. you just you don't take a kicker with the third brown pick, man. It's terrible, terrible value. Even if he was good, he had to be the best kicker in the NFL for a third round pick to be justified. 
and this dude's missing preseason kicks. Terrible. But then I've hated the Mitch Wisnowski pick since we drafted him. You know, you drafted you drafted a kicker in the third round, but at the end of the third round, you drafted Mitch Wisnowski at the beginning of the fourth round. People forget that. I was pissed off at that one. It's almost the same value, but 10 times worse because it's a punter. And this dude, he has never been a good NFL punter. I don't know why they love him so much. And then this year, I don't know what's happening. This is terrible. You got yeah. you got more value in your kickers that are not good than you have on your O-line this year. Mm-hmm. He had three punts for 95 yards, which gave him a 31.7-yard average. I feel like you probably have a special, like a skills player that can kick the ball further than that. You know, you always have that one guy on your team or two guys that played like punter in high school. They could probably kick the ball further than Mitch Wisnowski can because that shit's terrible. <laughs> first, they were like, oh, you. He, he's, uh, muffed, he muffed that first punt. That was just an accident or whatever. And then his next two punts were the exact same. So I guarantee that's not you, a good sign. 80% of the team could kick the ball 30 yards. 80%. Poe probably yeah, could. Yeah. That fool's hella athletic. That fool could probably kick the ball further than 30 yards. Yeah. yeah. But special teams gets an F. And your special teams as a whole is going to lose you a lot of games this year if they don't pick it up. You know, we've seen field position. If you don't change that field position, he's going to punt at 30 yards. You're going to be giving teams a ball on the 50-yard line or closer where they're going to have automatic three points. Muffing punts. We have seen the devastation that has caused this franchise over the years. Um, And then missing field goals, we've never had to deal with that heartbreak. We've seen teams deal with it. So I don't want to deal with that heartbreak. Yeah. Like we said in the last pod, we've always had decent kickers. You know, David Akers, Bill Dawson, uh, Robbie Gold. You know, I think those were the last three. Shit, even uh, Cortez. Remember the roofer? Yeah. I think we had that Chase McLaughlin against the Seattle Seahawks in 2019 when he missed that game-winning kick at the end of the game and we ended up losing the game in overtime. So that's a sign of what could happen this year with Jake Moody. So... We need to watch out for that. Um, You guys have any closing thoughts before we get out of here? You know, Um, go ahead. There's hope. The the ones looked good. You know what I mean? We we talk a lot about the bad and joke and stuff, but we still need a lot of work. But our ones did come out and look good. Looked like they were firing. Uh, You know, I think if we get a couple breaks, we could get through some of these games. It's going to be a tough season. We play a lot of good teams this year, you know, um, but our, you know, get this quarterback situation going, get the guys going with Debo and everybody looking good. It's pretty promising. I'm excited, excited for this year. Yeah. And with the injuries we mentioned, um, 49ers signed Anthony Miller. He was on the Steelers. He's been dealing with injuries. But he was really good with the Bears when he came into the league his first two years. He's played four total. Um, But I know myself and Alex, we loved him coming out of Memphis. He was a beast in college. So we'll see if he can, you know, drum up some interest in making this roster as one of the last wide receivers on the team. And then they signed Brian Hill at running back with the McNichols injury that we mentioned. So he's probably going to get a lot of work in this last preseason game. We'll see what he can do. Maybe he was in the XFL this past year. Don't know what he did there. But, you know, somebody got to step up in that running back room. We'll see what he can do this week. Yeah, definitely. Um, Yeah, so we play – Friday, I believe, against the Chargers, correct? Yeah. Friday night, last preseason game. Then we'll have the week off. Everybody in the NFL has the week off. 
And then the following week is week one, starting on Thursday. I think September 7th, I believe, is the first game. So, you know, season's coming up fast. Nick Bosa still not signed, almost getting to a point of concern for me, at least right now. I know even Matt Mayoko, who was like, who's been very calm about the whole situation, he said that it's almost getting to a point of concern because I think John Lynch said that Bosa needed three weeks to be ready for the season. And we're about at that three week mark, if not a little bit less until the first game. So that's concerning. We definitely need to get him in. If we don't have him, it's going to be a very long season. Got an inside tip. It'll be happening before this weekend. Keep it here with um, Blue Ball. Yeah. yeah. You you remember uh, last time we didn't have Nick Bosa for the whole season when he got injured. I think we ended up with, what, the eighth pick in the draft, 11th pick or something? Yeah. We were terrible. I don't yeah. remember, but we were terrible. Yeah. So that's concerning. Everybody keep your eye. I mean, the whole NFL is going to have their eyes on that because that's probably going to be a record-setting deal as well whenever it happens. So, yeah, that's uh, hashtag pay Bosa. We're starting a GoFundMe to get him paid. So go donate. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. And we'll probably be on next week to recap the last preseason game, looking into 53-man roster cutdowns as well. So tune in for that one. Anything else from you guys? Nope. All right. See y'all later. Yep. Peace.